In 1996, an unusual choice was made to hold a rally in a really unusual place. And the result of this rally very nearly ended with the loss of one person's life had it not been for the intervention of someone else, someone unexpected. For reasons that seemingly only made sense to them and them alone, the Ku Klux Klan decided to host one of their hate-filled white supremacist rallies in the town of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Ann Arbor is an unusual choice because out of all the cities in Michigan, Ann Arbor is one of the most culturally and ethnically diverse. So the idea of holding a white supremacist rally in the midst of Ann Arbor, Michigan was an odd choice. When the citizens of Ann Arbor became aware that this particular group wanted to host a rally in their town, naturally some of them decided that it was an opportune time for them to protest, for them to make sure that the KKK knew that their specific brand of hatred was not welcomed in their city. And the particular day that in mind, uh, uh, tensions were awfully high. I think that goes without saying, to be honest with you. Police were there in full riot gear. They had tear gas at the ready, doing everything they can to keep these two sides separate from one another. They did everything in their power to maintain that peace and to allow things to not get out of hand. Um, and for a while, it genuinely seemed like things were going to be peaceful and things were going to be calm in the midst of all of this, even though this particular group had caused quite a stir in this community. But one man, in the wrong place, at the wrong time, with the wrong kind of tattoo, somehow managed to find his way into the group of protesters and almost lit a match into this already waiting powder keg. The gentleman in question is believed to have come to attend the Klan rally itself. But whether he parked on the wrong side of the street, got off at the wrong garage, something along those lines, he somehow managed to find himself in the middle of the protest group. Now typically this could kind of go without any sort of notification whatsoever. It wouldn't alert the group. There were plenty of white folks that were there in the midst of this protest group. However, this particular gentleman chose to wear a sleeveless t-shirt and emblazoned upon his shoulder was an SS tattoo, one of the symbols of the Nazi party and a symbol that is also commonly associated with white supremacist groups. Somebody in the midst of that crowd who happened to be holding a megaphone saw this gentleman and saw his tattoo and announced to the entire waiting crowd there there's a Klansman in this crowd. Suddenly this already on edge group of people began to clamor and look around until they spotted the man in question. And when he realized that he was on the wrong side of the fence in a very literal sense of the word, he turned and he ran off, trying to do everything he could to flee this particular crowd. Again, I'll remind you that things were already tense before this rally ever began and before this gentleman was ever noticed by the crowd of protesters. Um, but him being in this situation seemed to only make things worse. Someone in the midst of this crowd, they either shoved him or they struck him or something got thrown at him. There's never been really any clear indication of what happened. But we do know that this gentleman with this tattoo that symbolizes a well-known worldwide hate group fell. And when he fell to the ground, one of the protesters, caught up in the midst of the emotion of the situation, shouted from the top of his voice, kill the Nazi. And before too long, that became a chant as this group of protesters began to crowd around this fallen man. And before long, this crowd of protesters began to kick him, and strike him, and hit him with their signs do everything they could. If their situation was not intervened, if somebody did not come and put a stop to this, it's very likely that this man's life would have ended in a much different way. But that is when possibly the least of any expected help at all arrived. It arrived in the form of Keisha Thomas, an African-American, 18-year-old high school girl. 
Keisha saw the crowd, she saw their emotional reactions, and she saw them attacking this man who was again wearing a tattoo that symbolized hatred towards people like Keisha. But as much as Keisha stood against what the KKK symbolized, as much as she stood against what this gentleman's tattoo seemed to indicate he believed, Keisha didn't want to see anybody get hurt or even killed in the midst of this rally. So Keisha did the only thing that she could. She did everything she could to kind of spread the crowd away, to get them away from stopping to strike him, and then to make sure that nobody else would hit him, Keisha threw herself on top of him to protect him, to keep him safe. This image is maybe one of the most powerful images I've ever seen. Again, remember, it's more than a little plausible to assume that this guy had come to this event to join with a group that is openly, publicly, actively against people like Keisha simply because of the color of her skin. It is more than likely that had their situations been reversed, he might not have done the same thing as she had done for him. And I'm certain that there were probably more than a few people in in the crowd there that day, and maybe even one or two in this crowd here today, who thought that his viewpoints and his misguided hatred were reason enough to justify the beating that he was taking. Had Keisha not intervened, this story, this man's life, would have had entirely different endings. But this brave young woman chose to show compassion to a man who probably didn't deserve it. This photo, in my mind, is the embodiment of the word mercy. Mercy is something that we tend to struggle with throughout our lives. It's an issue that we never really quite get over. No matter how old we get, no matter how much we've come to know or how long we've been a Christian, we still struggle with the very concept of mercy itself. When somebody has wronged us or we feel that somebody has hurt us and, and caused us some sort of pain, our natural inclination is not to show mercy. Our natural inclination is to make them feel the same pain that they caused us to try to inflict that pain or to to watch them face the consequences of their actions, to see them hurt in the way that they have hurt us and those around us. When somebody causes somebody else pain, when somebody causes us to feel hurt, we want what we consider to be justice. And it doesn't matter, it's to varying degrees. It could be for the slightest of offenses, it could be something more significant than that. But each one of us in this room, we've been hurt by somebody. Each one of us who's been alive for more than a couple of years has probably had somebody hurt us in some way, shape, or form. And when we experience that pain, our natural inclination is to want to see that pain reflected on those who caused it to us. We don't want to give mercy We want what we think is justice, but is actually probably closer to revenge. And so Jesus, like he's done so many other times as we've talked about these Beatitudes, tells us something that stands in direct conflict with what our natural setting seems to be. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, verse 7, he says, Blessed are the merciful. Now, we might understand this particular thought to a point, right? We may, we may get this to a limit. If something minor happens to us, if somebody maybe cuts us off in traffic or somebody cuts in front of us in line at the grocery store, we might be willing to just let it go, not say anything, not do anything, show them mercy even though what they did was kind of a jerk thing to do. But each and every one of us, we hit a certain point in our lives where that affront to us, something that violates our sense of right or wrong, becomes so severe that we can't show mercy. We have to speak up. We have to do something. We have to say something. And so mercy is something that we struggle with. We want justice. We want them to feel pain. And mercy is actively choosing to show someone compassion or forgiveness when their actions don't deserve it. Who wants to do that? 
Who wants to show compassion and forgiveness to somebody who's hurt us or others? Mercy is not something that comes easy for us. And so the idea that Jesus tells us that we're blessed when we're merciful is hard for us to wrap our minds around. But maybe the way that we come to understand mercy and understand the significance of it and even understand the blessing that comes through being merciful, maybe the best way for us to learn that is when we're shown mercy ourselves. In fact, I'm willing to believe that that's probably how things worked out for the woman in our text today. We're going to be in John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. So if you've got your Bible or your Bible app, go ahead and turn there. John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, as we talk about one of the most profound acts of mercy in the ministry of Jesus. As you're getting there, let me tell you, this is in the middle of Jesus' ministry, like pretty much dead center of his ministry. Jesus is hanging outside of the temple, and he's, he's doing what he does. He's teaching people. He's, he's showing them the gospel. He's teaching them about the kingdom of heaven and about what the kingdom of God is going to be like. He's expounding all kinds of different scripture towards these folks in an effort to try to lead them to understanding more about God so that they may come to follow him. Now the Pharisees and the other religious leaders at this time, they've, they've kind of shifted their viewpoint on Jesus. They've, they've come to understand that Jesus, this guy's kind of a problem. See, everywhere he goes, he's gathering together all these loud, large crowds of people, and, and he's saying some things that are a little radical, things that go outside the norm of what the rest of us are teaching, things that go outside the norm of what the temple has been proclaiming for generations. And if we're not careful, if we don't do something about this, we might lose the people. And so they, they come up with this plan to try to get rid of Jesus. And the first phase of that plan is let's try to discredit him as a teacher. Because if he's not credible, then he can't teach anymore and people aren't going to listen to him and everything's going to be fine. And so they do things like try to throw out questions about scripture and about what the Bible has to say in an effort to try to get him twisted up. They talk to him about things about how to interact with the Roman government, who they all consider to be their enemy. Yet everything that Jesus says falls into line with what Scripture says. None of them can refute it. None of them can deny it. None of them can prove him wrong. And then a situation just kind of falls right into their lap. A situation comes up that seems almost so perfect, there's no chance that this can fail. And we see what that situation is when we get to verse 3. It says, Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the center. The Pharisees, the other teachers, they've become aware of this woman who is actively engaging in an adulterous relationship. She is violating her marital vows. She's engaged in a relationship with someone who is not her husband. So, they drag her out, possibly kicking and screaming, not just right in front of Jesus, but in the center of this large crowd that's gathered outside the temple. And I'll remind you, the temple, well, that's more or less the center of town. Try to imagine what's going through her mind in this moment. Try to picture what she might be feeling. It'd be bad enough if just the people in her life found out about the affair. It'd be bad enough if her husband found out or, or her family. It'd likely end in divorce. It'd likely end in her maybe being even ostracized by her own family members. And that's only if they found out. But now as she's been caught in the middle of this act, as she's engaged in this affair, she's likely not fully clothed in this moment, and she's being thrust in front of the entire community. Her shame on full display for everyone to see. She refuses to look up. you got to imagine that. She's got her eyes just straight down on the ground because if she looks up, she may see some people that she recognizes. She might make eye contact with some friends. She may even see some of her family members in the midst of this crowd. So she tries her best not to make eye contact with anyone staring at her feet. 
the secret that she'd worked so hard to keep quiet, the secret relationship she did everything to make sure that nobody found out about, is now loudly, clearly, completely on display for the entire town. There is no going back from this moment. There's no rectifying the situation. There's no making this better. There's no getting past this particular moment in time. Her little secret has just been made public. Can you imagine the shame that she feels? And if that wasn't bad enough for her, somehow it's about to get worse, or at least it's going to threaten to get worse. One of the Pharisees who brought her out, who put her shame on display for the entire town to see like some sort of messed up piece of art, asked this guy who's there teaching them what we see in verses 4 and 5. He says, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. But what do you say? When they say the words pronouncing the law's requirements, when they announce what the law says a woman like her has to be, that's the moment that she looks up. Her eyes dart towards the Pharisee who said this, who proclaimed her death needed to happen. Her eyes dart to this teacher that he's talking to, this guy that she doesn't recognize, wondering what's going to happen here. See, she never really thought about that during the whole affair. She never thought about this when this relationship began. But suddenly, whenever he mentions this, something in the back of her mind reminds her of Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, where Moses said, if a man commits adultery with a married woman, if he commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. She never thought about that before. I mean, sure, she, she'd heard that law, she'd heard that scripture proclaimed whenever she was a kid, but she never expected that they might actually carry it out. When she was a kid, she heard whispers about other men and women in the community. Nothing was ever really proved, but everybody knew. But nothing happened to them. But now these men, these these teachers of the law, she's hearing them talk about enacting this law, of carrying this law through, of seeing this consequence of her actions take place. She didn't know that this might happen, but she knew the law, but they weren't really going to do anything about it, right? They weren't going to carry it out. They weren't really going to kill her, were they? And now they're asking this one man in front of this crowd, this teacher who she's never really seen before, but now her entire life is in his hands. And and so what does this guy do? What does this dude who she doesn't know, but now for some reason is in charge of whether or not she lives or die? How does he react to this grave responsibility? How does he react whenever this life is placed in the midst of his hands? Does he say... Yes, we should kill her. Does he say things like, everybody grab a rock, let her fly? Or does he say, guys, you're being overreactive, you're being legalistic? Any of that would have been better than what he actually did. Because this guy who has just been asked whether or not she should live or die, sits down and starts writing in the dirt. Out of all the possible scenarios that had flashed through her mind in those moments after he'd been asked that, this was probably not one of them. What an odd reaction for him to have. My life is in your hands, and now you feel like you got to write out your grocery list? This is the moment where you figure out how to write your to-do list for the rest of the day? This is such an unusual thing for her to do. What is he doing in the midst of this? She might think that he's just biding time. Maybe he's just trying to prolong the torment and the shame that she feels in this moment. Maybe he's just toying with her. Maybe he's trying to get her to the point that she actually wants to die. She's practically there now. 
She didn't mean to cheat on her husband. She didn't mean for this affair to happen. It just sort of happened. And then once it got started, she tried everything she could to, to make it stop, to break off this relationship, but she kept, she kept coming back to it. Now she's, she's hearing about this law and, and being reminded of what this law means. And, and there's a moment where she realizes, I probably deserve that. I deserve the death that this law requires from me. Maybe that's what should happen to me. But her accusers, and can you really call them accusers if they're 100% right? Her accusers are getting just as irritated with this teacher's response as she may have been at first. They start getting impatient. They demand this guy tell them what they want to know. And, and frankly, at this point, she wants to know what he says too. She wants this to be over. At this point, she probably doesn't care how it ends. Just get this over with. Tell them that I should die. Tell them that they should let me go. Who cares anymore? Just say something. Make this moment end. Make this shame that I'm feeling be over. She's embarrassed. She knows she deserves what she's supposed to get. So just say it already. Let it happen. Finally, after they keep pressing him and demanding him to give him an answer, this guy just stands up, and wipes the dirt off his hands, and then he finally raises his eyes. He looks at her for a moment. and She can't bring herself to keep his gaze. She goes right back to looking at her feet. He looks over at the Pharisees that brought her here, who put her on display, the men who caught her, who thrust her in the midst of this public square and proclaimed her sin for everyone to know about. He opens his mouth. And she braces herself for what he's about to say, what's about to come next, what she knows is going to happen, that he's going to say that they should kill her. But instead, he says what we read in verse 7. He says, the one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. That wasn't exactly what she expected to hear, but, but it's enough. See, because while she's not maybe the most religious person in town, she knows who these men are that brought her. They're the Pharisees. They have a relationship with God that nobody else does. They're enamored by it. That's all they ever talk about. That's all they ever want to be about. They study scripture backwards, forwards, inside, out. They, they love the Bible so very much that they've got passages of it written on parchment that is placed around their wrists, that's wrapped around their foreheads, that's hanging from their very clothing. These guys are as infatuated with God as anybody possibly could be. And so naturally, of course, they know what sins are and they know how to avoid them. So she shuts her eyes tight, expecting the pain of that first rock to hit her, hoping beyond hope that maybe it'll hit her in the temple and kill her immediately and this can be over. She's already wincing before the pain starts. But after what feels like forever, she's noticed the first rock hasn't hit her. She begins to hear a sound taking place, and it sounds almost like, like footsteps. She kind of peeks her eye out, and she sees some of these guys, the ones who brought her here, the ones who accused her, starting to walk away. She doesn't understand what's going on. She can't wrap her mind around this particular situation. She doesn't get what's going on. She can't believe it. Just a minute ago, they all wanted to kill her. The law says she has to die. It's what she deserves. And yet they're walking away. They're leaving their stones behind. They're, they're getting away from her. And what is this Jesus guy doing? Well, he's back to writing in the dirt. What a strange man. What does any of this mean? What's going to happen? Can, 
can we be done now? Finally, after what feels like forever, Jesus stands back up again, wipes the dirt from his hands, and he looks around. And Jesus begins to quietly make his way over towards her. It flashes across her mind for a moment there that he may still kill her. This still may happen. Maybe he wanted to do this by himself. Maybe he wanted it all for himself. Maybe he wants to give her what she deserves. But finally, after Jesus is done surveying the whole area, he looks at her. And his eyes don't look angry. They don't look vengeful. His eyes look like they're filled with compassion. He leans into her and he he asks her what we read in verse 10. He says, Women, or woman, where are they? Has, Has nobody condemned you? She becomes aware of the moment that she's shaking. There's still a part of her that's scared about what's going to happen next. She doesn't know what to say. She stammers out, No one, Lord. And then he looks at her again and gives her just a subtle little smile and says what we read in the rest of verse 11, that neither do I condemn you. Go now. Do not sin anymore. And then he just leaves. It probably takes her a few moments to really wrap her mind around what just happened. To really understand what just took place here. To process everything that happened. She was caught. She was red-handed in the middle of an act that the law of Moses says that she should die. It was pretty clear on that. She's dragged out here. Her sin on display. Her shame there for the entire world to see. The entire town knows what she did in secret. What she tried to keep hidden. What she tried to keep private. They all wanted to kill her. She should be dead now. She deserves to be dead now. She'd broken the law. She sinned. And the law was clear as to what that sin should lead to. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus showed her compassion. Jesus showed her love. Jesus showed her mercy. Her sin meant that she should die. And yet Jesus withheld her punishment. As that realization begins to set in, she takes a deep breath. Tears start streaming down her face as she comes to the realization she is free. Mercy is something that we don't really understand or appreciate until we've been given it, until someone shows us mercy, until our actions and our sinfulness have led us to a consequence and a punishment that we should have. But instead, we're shown compassion. Instead, we're shown forgiveness. Our punishment is withheld from us. I'm guessing for this woman that after this encounter, man, the next time somebody said or did something that was hurtful to her or something that maybe had that spark of, I'm going to get revenge on you, maybe even as something as simple as somebody reminding her of this day, that there'd be a little tick in the back of her mind that would say, you know what? Jesus showed me mercy when I didn't deserve it. So maybe I ought to show that mercy to them as well. This is not an easy choice for us to make. If anybody ever said mercy should be simple, then they don't understand mercy. This is something that is very difficult for us to choose, to to choose to withhold the punishment that we feel, that we know, that we sense within our very innermost being that they deserve it. And still choose to withhold it. That's a hard choice. It's a difficult thing to not enact what you feel someone deserves. And yet, 
It is a very necessary thing for us as the followers of Jesus to choose. It's a hard choice because it goes against our internal instincts, and yet it is the choice that Jesus tells us to make. And he tells us that when we make that choice to withhold punishment that is deserved and instead show compassion and forgiveness, he tells us that that's when we're blessed. Understand, our own selfishness, our own choices, our own sin are our own doing. And yet, God still chooses to show us mercy. I can't Put it any better than the way that Paul did in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, where he says, But God, who is rich in mercy. What a wonderful, wonderful description. Because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in our trespasses. Even though we deserve death, even though we deserve because of our own sinfulness, our own choices, our own mistakes. God still showed us love through Jesus. You are saved by grace. Christians, church, we should be the most merciful people the world has ever seen. Because you and I have been shown great mercy. Scripture is clear. Sin leads to death. Each one of us in this room has sinned. Some of you have sinned multiple times today. And yet God still shows us mercy because of his great love for us. And when we are given mercy, we should show mercy. And when we show mercy, we're given even more mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy.